All right, so time to go blind versus blind. This is the timeline for today. The spot, very easy. We open race, small blind first in and villain calls big blind. Most examples or all the examples are from small blinds perspective, but you can treat that vice versa as well, right? You can say villain is open raising small blind and we call in the big blind that works the same way. I just showed you random depending on the rake, right? I just filtered for a non limping strategy with a certain rake. It's like a standard whatever opening range on the left and a standard calling range on the right. Just seeing that we have very, very wide ranges for tournament players. This is even more interesting and even more important because ranges get wider, right? If we include limping, we get even wider ranges. Right? I just talk about 100 big blind with big blind ante, uh, lots of limping, lots of checking back, very, very wide ranges. And then we can jump into the next thing and quickly recap my strategy that I use there, my simplifications. So I kept the ranges here for the overview. The problem we are facing is just Small line range here is 578 combos. Big blind range is 490 combos. You don't need to know those numbers. You just need to know it's a lot, right? And navigating those and arguing like, I have more sets, I have more this, I have more two pairs, I am stronger, whatever. Talking about six combos, 10 combos, 20 combos won't help you a lot to really understand that spot. It's just too big. So we need to freaking simplify that we really in depth understand those spots. Right. So the way I do that and the way I did present it in the poker code lessons is always through simplification and through cornerstones. Right. So first thing I did write down here is I split things up on the flop into a range bet, range check and trade off boards. Right. So it's like boards where we bet everything or our entire range, some spots where we should check everything and the in between boards and like a way of thinking on those which helps us to break down the continuations, right? So next was kind of talking about the double barrels. Next was to talk about how we play after a check and facing a bet and the late game tree and like really cut things down, which is something I can't do today. It's way too much for that. You should definitely sign up and see all the videos. You see, there's plenty of work to be, to be done. Lots of hours going in there small examples, big examples, big sessions, lots of theory. So yeah, blind versus blind is just a very, very, very big spot. And that's it. The whole key, if you really want to understand things in depth, it means you need to break things down, make them simple for your brain to have a strategy, to have your cornerstones. I always want to have those that I know exactly which, like which parts of which hand class am I playing which way. So this is a message to you guys, everyone who wants to improve the materials out there, the explanations in depth, you just got to sign up and, and check those out. So next step is the truth about population. And I'll just show you two things, right? That just every database shows is this here. The player pool overfolds massively in wide range spots. And I'm not talking just about the flop. I'm not talking just about the turn. And I'm not talking just about the river. It's the combination of everything. Usually people overfold to triple barrels, to double barrels, to single barrels, to delayed bets, to double delayed bets. All of those usually get overfolds on average from the average player. Obviously there are some Brazilians out there. They are not overfolding, right? So the second thing is, the player pool is not aggressive enough in wide range spots. This is why it's not a tendency. This is why I'm presenting something like that. And this is why it's just very, very natural, right? It's tough to navigate when you have nothing. It's very natural to throw away your hand when you have nothing, whatever nothing might mean in the, co in the context, right? When you have king high, sometimes it's an okay hand. Right? When you have just an ace high, when you have a bottom pair with three overcards. And the other thing, not aggressive enough, right? Not understanding relative hand strength that actually you have lots of value hands compared to villain maybe, and you need to add lots of bluffs. Who has the advantage in those spots? So we end up people not bluffing enough in the first place, which means we see cards cheaper than we should is the first thing. And the second thing is that if they check they are weaker than they should be because, well, if they are not betting their bluffs or their ear or whatever, it needs to be somewhere. 
So now I talked already a little about what does that mean to just like break it down and I'm definitely missing things. We over realize equity is one thing. Right? Just imagine you bet something, you have a queen high board, you bet your king five suited nothing. And you know villain is raising less often than he should. It means you see the turn more often than you should. You will hit a king sometimes, which will give you EV. Right? So this is just immediate profit because of that overrealization. Right? You don't need to throw your hand away. Same thing, you check a board when you have nothing, you see a turn card. Now you might have something with a hand that would have check folded instead. So just overrealizing equity because people are too passive in general. All right, the second thing, you get away with immediate EV when bluffing. Take that very simple spot. We check the flop, villain checks back. We check the turn, villain checks back. We bet small on the river. Like no way villain is, is not overfolding as a general thing. And we can have any shit, right? This is just a spot. Didn't bluff the flop enough, he sits on shit on the turn. He didn't bluff the turn, now he still sits on shit on the river. We bet he folds. So it's just that thing, air versus air is kind of the first bet wins very often. And that is something that goes street by street, works on every street. I just took that very, very easy example because there is no further gameplay. And another thing, you being more aggressive, you deny equity effectively. Maybe the better example is if we are big blind, right? Villain checks to you on 763, you don't give this free card. You bet most of your jack 10 and villain folds his queen 10. Right? So it's just, well, something folds. So now let us talk about the exploits, right? I call it the plan of small punches, right? So we want to hammer on that weak part of their range. To make it very clear, I want to give villain the maximum amount of chances to play incorrect. Now, knowing that they incorrect, that they play incorrectly by overfolding and by not raising especially, we know how we get in there. So what do we need to do? We need to bet. To bet that they have a chance to overfold and that we benefit from them not raising. If we check, well, we benefit from them not betting enough and we can punish them in the late game then, yes, as well. But we need to put out those bets when the right moment has come. Right? So here, second thing, small bets are the key. When ranges are still wide, if we are talking about triple barrels and everything gets here and we want to represent the world now, this is not what I call a knockout fight. Right? It's like, this is not what we want to go for because villain has a tighter range now as well. This is pretty much the whole message for today's session, the small punches and giving you examples for that. The little game tree. It's just the flop game plan of blind versus blind to just see all the options we're having. I, I explain it quickly, right? We start as the small blind, let's say small blind is hero. So what can we do? We can check, big blind turns over, checks back. And that leads us to an opportunity. This is how I want to see it, an option. Villain is now very likely or an average more full of shit than he should be, which means we have the small blinds option of the delayed bet. Beautiful option. What could happen as well is we check Big blind decides to bet. Well, if you fold, it's over, not shit. But if we call, there are some turns that we can donk bet and some turns that we should donk bet. We could obviously check raise, and this is a little tougher now, right? This is not really a wide range anymore. After villain called a check raise on the flop, he did bet himself. He did call a check raise that is usually a little larger in those spots. And then we see a turn. It's, this is not really our spot, but obviously it's an option as well. What else could we do? do? We can obviously start by betting. And this here is too small. This is already a simplified game tree. Obviously we can have multiple bet sizes, but we could be betting. And then villain folds and we know already they are overfolding. So we make money right away by betting. They can call, which means they are weak. They did not race. Great, great information. They call, they did not race, which means we cannot double barrel. Depending on the turn card, depending on our hand with small sizes, big sizes, crazy sizes or other stuff. Or they raise us in which we mainly should overfold given the truth about population or we can call and this is now a wild one, right? Donk after calling race. So the clearest ones we want to go for is the delayed bet fits our session today is an awesome, awesome small punch. The donk bet executed in the right way is an awesome punch as well. The double barrel, the small double barrel fits our strategy of the small punches as well. It's not only that I talk you into bluffing a lot, I feel like, but once we have the knowledge, we can go very thinly for value as well. So that's very good also. Just making use of villain showing their hand in a way. Okay, that's it actually. And now we'll get just two examples. Four cards for the delayed bet. Minus 10 deuce deuce. 
and turn is not an ace that makes things too simple is another 10. 10 deuce deuce goes check check and the spot where we can block bet is high as much as we want we can block bet a lot and villain sits there kind of the same thing sits there with lots of lots of bullshit right so first our block betting strategy villain's reaction and now again two things why is that so effective because they have the hands that they are forced to fold too often i mean you see they sometimes need to call nine five here not, not happening they fold nine five so one thing is they have those folding hands too often because they did not bluff the flop secondly they overfold those hands too often i don't think that on most stakes and even the highest stakes people call their jack eight offsuit here they fold it and the second thing two reasons for that natural leak and the third one they miss their bluff raises right so they are not only just having that jack three but they fold it every time instead of ever raising that a block bet on this board you need to bluff an absolute there's no equity bluff no no draw no nothing you need to go with an absolute insane air ball to bluff and versus a block bet here bluffing jack three is kind of advanced so they're not raising enough wide range versus right range and all the hands you have feel shit and this is where people overfold the most so i expect more than 45 percent folds here okay so let's Go to the next one. So we check call the flop and we want to donk the turn. This here is the beautiful one. The seven, four, four. it can obviously be any trips that turn, any, any paired board that turns to trips. Where villain should start betting big a lot because he has the trip advantage and wraps a lot of trips plus the straight draws. This is why it shows something with straight draw, straight draws, bet all the four X, not much trapping going on here. Add all the straight draws, lots of that stuff, like all the 10, six suiteds, and so on and then it's it's not the over bet but a big bet lots of pressure and then just the the, the turn card says sir you re represented a hell of a lot of 4x we cut that in half like actually you don't have that and you're full of shit and on top we decrease the value of all your straight draws because hitting a straight on the three four board doesn't help you at all and this is what we see and now we can sit here with a freaking ace high and fold out the equity that villain has with like a six eight but that's freaking 10 outs against our ace high. So this is beautiful, beautiful usage of villain is full of shit and he can't do anything. That's a 20% bet and he needs to fold, let's see, 31% while already calling any jack high, raising jack nine. So I bet more like 50% folding. Now let's get to the next spot. Put it into the check raise flop. I go for it because there are some boards that people are stabbing it's fine to stab but then really tough to defend it's one of my favorite boards Jerome knows me so here we go my favorite board nine five deuce rainbow the one where villain has nothing and we have it all right no offsuit two pairs for villain and that just makes our over pairs nuts that's the reason why this is the board where we want to get maximum amount of money in the middle now villain has some pocket nines some he is three betting he has pocket fives and deuces and that's it. And then he has the suited combinations of two pairs. So we can stack off pocket tens here, which means we can try to get the maximum money in the middle before there is lots of connectivity going on. So here we can look it up. Tens, jacks, queens, kings, our main interest, I would say, maybe some ace nine is mixing. It wants to get a bit big pot and tries to achieve that by betting big or by check raising. Ace queen nine is awesome as well, but here I clearly prefer the big bet ourselves compared to the check raise because villain's stabbing frequency should be way lower. Here, it's very natural that people are betting sometimes because they have 9x, they have 5x, they want to protect, plus they have the straight connectivity. For them, it seems like they have something, but they are not backing that up with nuts, really. So checking here, villain betting, let's go with like half pot or something, half, like a little, little here, little there. Let's take what's the highest, half pot, even highest frequency. And then we see something beautiful. Oh, not, not in this one. I had another sim where it shows the 150% check raise sizing because it clearly showed going for the maximum amount of money in the middle right now. All right, so let's take this year now, the check raises with the overcards plus backdoor. And now you can, you can guess the best turn card. Let's take your 10, the 10. And this is something where we can do lots of damage, right? Everything improves to either a straight draw or a top here. And still our ace nine is good enough to, to rather stack off and river put another deuce out there so all our straight draw busts but it shouldn't matter too much yeah rainbow makes it better that villain has nothing to navigate he follows up with the backdoor flush draws on the flop 
on the turn, they are all shit. So he has the maximum amount of nothing, right? So 55% jamming here on that river. is not just not enough. But if we do something crazy like this here, then see you later. See you later, big blind. And off we are, right? So now even on the queen, we can, we can, we can block better ace nine for value now. The other one, I think it was just better to, to check call. We're not folding ace nine anywhere. Now having the question as always, when it comes to check raising that we need villain to bet that first, right? So I'm showing that again. We need villain to bet the stuff that he can then fold. So it's good for us if he bets jack 10, because this is something he will fold. If he bets, I don't know, his king seven bluff is, is good if it is there. We check raise our jack 10, he's out of there, right? So it's kind of not good for us if villain checks all that shit back. And we figured out, hey, villains are on average not betting often enough. So maybe it's better for us to be on the big bet end if it's anyways indifferent against the solver. But here I find the reasons because people have lots of gut shots, lots of bad back doors, which gives them a reason. It's not the, I have nothing. It, it feels like they connect to the board. And then after the check raise, realize that they have nothing. Let's get to the last example, the double barrel. King seven deuce, jack. King seven deuce and he makes it a jack. Interesting. Better card for us than the four for sure. So we have more options. We see a 16%. Okay. We give ourselves an advantage, a jack, right? It's a good card for us. Lots of fans that want to maybe buy a next card, go for a thin value. Even the jack 10 we can bet. We have additional fold equity. What are we folding out? Is it a success if we fold it out? Villain folds ace highs. That's a big success. Even for our king x, weak king x, we want to maybe play like that. For our jack x, villain is folding something like queen eight suited, queen six suited, queen. Big success for a jack x, right? What I like more is even better this one here, not flush draw. I just want to turn flop and jack of clubs and this here around. I'm not sure whether it shows more percentage now, uh, probably about same, but this is where I implemented a little more myself because it's more clearly the good card for me. It leads to more big betting. I can do more overall and I can, sp I can split things in a way I like. Okay, I show one last thing that will be part of the key takeaways. My favorite board again and say exactly what we are making use of that villains are doing. Villain checks to you on 9-5 dues. What do you think I want you to do when you have 10-8 offsuit? First right answer is bet, right? So this is the thing. If hands are indifferent, it means that anyways in the solver world, both has the same EV. Now we figure out two things. People are overfolding also as aggressor and we know their checking ranges are weaker because they bet when they have something a little more. What else do we know? What we know for sure, maybe they are folding, but even if they are calling, we know for sure that they are not check raising 13%. Do they call their King 10 offsuit? Likely not. And that is enough together with the future game tree. Right? We just over realize they are not check raising ace nine, King nine, like with those frequencies. So we realize the equity hitting a 10. If it's indifferent and what I wrote down today is true, then in the real world, betting is better. All right, so just really understanding it like that. Indifference in the solver does not mean indifference in the real world. And usually, and now we, we have the knowledge how people are playing in a natural way, we know which one is slightly better. Okay, that gets us to the last slide. Key takeaways. We figured out why today, I just write it down again, the small punches can create a lot of EV. And I start with the last sentence here. Next, stay away from big fights. This, I don't want you to go triple, go triple barrel over bat all in crazy. This is not what I tried to teach today. It's big ranges. Make sure of villain overfolding his shit part. People are bad with playing shit. People are not bad with playing strong hands. Maybe bad, but in another way as well. So, and this is what I just tried to explain once more. Whenever a hand is indifferent in the solver world, you should likely go the more aggressive way when you benefit from villain folding. All right, thanks for everyone who was here. Yeah, I would love everyone who signs up, poker code who isn't there already. Also the free account, make use of that. And everyone who I can welcome in the team at some point, definitely happy to welcome you in the Discord. See you soon, guys. Have, have a great day.